If you Canadians have a hard time, I get going too fast and don't understand me, slow me down. Let me know or I'll get Dave to interpret. Now, I'm a good old boy from South Carolina and Bill's a damn Yankee. And so, do y'all, do you Canadians know what a damn Yankee is? The difference in a Yankee and a damn Yankee? Well, Yankees, they come down to Myrtle Beach, they stay about two weeks, and they go back home. A damn Yankee comes down and never leaves. And that's what Bill is. <laughs> um, this was my last time I was an international lecturer. Now we're international lecturers since we've got to come to Canada. That's my son, that's my brother-in-law, he's a dental lab guy, and this is an ADA dumb dentist right here. The rest of you guys are just dive buddies. So I tried to convert him on the boat, and he wouldn't listen, and the school of fish I was trying to lecture to, they wouldn't listen, but I did get a few minutes in when we were down in Miami waters there. I'm going to start off with uh, talking about how we affect the environment. And then, maybe after lunch, we'll get into the safe mercury procedures where we can protect our own environment. Dental all 
over the country, and there's a lot more dentists in a lot of other places than white. We did find, we have found recently, that our mercury levels have gone down. So um, that's good news. We want to continue to work with the dental offices. So my goal is to clean up my act, and certainly do what I can to not put any more mercury in the system. Um, I think that uh, that we're going to be finding more and more that the EPA or the sta or state governments or the federal government are going to be looking at dentistry to clean up the mercury discharge and possibly uh, go in and replumb some of their offices. Um, any expenses that have been incurred, I have readily paid for, uh, and. We have so many expenses in, in dentistry. And the, you know, the cost of uh, installing the equipment and changing the filters and recycling the mercury to make sure it doesn't enter the environment is minimal. I know there's a trend to not use amalgam, uh, and possibly in 15 years we won't be placing any more amalgam restorations, but we'll still be removing them. And amalgam has to go somewhere and it's 50% mercury. You know, the technology exists now to eliminate any additional dental source mercury. I feel that dentists are morally, professionally, and ethically bound to do whatever they can to stop adding mercury to the environment. The most interesting place in Columbus County to me is Lake Waccamaw which is a 9,000 acre freshwater natural lake. Um, it's the largest natural freshwater lake east of the Mississippi between Maine and Florida. And in about 1994, I read in the local newspaper that high levels of mercury had been found in some of the fish in one of the feeder creeks of Lake Waccamaw and also in the Waccamaw River, which drains the water from Lake Waccamaw. Because of our efforts in this office, we were recognized by the Friends of Lake Waccamaw, who are a group of people interested in maintaining quality rivers, lakes, and streams, and are associated with some researchers at East Carolina University for taking steps to lead our profession and lead our community in eliminating any additional mercury. What we need to do is get dentists involved and excited about this. This lake has been clean and safe ever since I've been associated with it. I'd like for it to be that way in 10 or 15 or 20 years when my children try to bring their children here. Now, this was produced in 1997 by Phil Davis, who's a member of ours. And ironically, in December of this past year, Phil asked me to go speak to a consortium of sewage treatment operators. And their issue, their whole day, they have a meeting once a year and they get together and their whole meeting was on mercury and their influence. So nothing's been done in North Carolina. And the reason they were having this meeting and were really concerned is because the EPA notified them that they needed to do something about it. Now Canada's way ahead, I understand, because y'all are required in most places to have amalgam separators, correct? Well, in the United States, we only have 13 states that required out of 50. Okay, all right. Um, so we're way behind. So we appreciate the Canadians not dumping their mercury on us because we're dumping enough on ourselves. <laughs> um, this is available as a uh, kind of a display you can put or you can get these and get them on your website. It uh, kind of tracks the toxic journey of mercury back into our environment. 
Um, I can't read it from my slides, but this is part of the UNEP program, United Nations Environmental Program that we've been involved with. And they report that 10% of global mercury usage is from amalgam tooth fillings. And you get 340 tons of dental mercury journeying back into the environment. Dentists are the second largest users of elemental mercury in the United States, and we still place over 30 million mercury fillings annually. Now, the general public kind of thinks we've quit doing it. I have so many patients that come in, they, I guess because I don't do it, they think other dentists don't do it. So you have to educate our public a little bit to inform them that plenty of people are still doing it. And so it goes back into the environment, straight in from our chair sides. Um, and we all know it's 50% mercury and that the ADA recommends that the capsules be stored in an airtight container and collected by a hazardous waste company. And the ADA is really on board with us having separators in the states. Uh, I think three years ago, the EPA was, they were going to make a mandatory ruling for all dentists to have separators. And of course, they, uh, the ADA had to jump in and stop that, because that would require we send in a piece of paper that we had a separator. You know, but really bad regulation for them. So they made a deal with the EPA that they would try to get 20% of the dentists in the country to have separators. And they did a little test pilot project in South Carolina, and somehow I got on the committee, and they wished I never had, but uh, it didn't work. They did a little survey. They wrote a letter to ask the dentist to put in a separator. They then did a little survey to see how many people had separators. And I looked at the guys on the list, and I go, wait a minute. I know two of these guys real well. I've been in their offices. They don't have separators. So I called him up. I said, Jamie, uh, you don't have a separator, do you? He said, yeah, I do. That little chair side thing, on, you know, the little trap. I said, no, Jamie, you don't have a separator. So I told them all their uh, data was bogus, and they got mad, and they shut down the program, and I don't know what else happened after that. But it was not successful. The dentists in the states are not going to voluntarily put in separators. Now, we've got more separators than we used to because new offices, the dental companies sell a separator. They're making a little money, and they know that. But we aren't trapping hardly any of our mercury coming out. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, where does it go? It goes back into the environment. It goes through our different kind of sewage treatment operation plants. Um, and it can't really be, be cleaned out of that sludge. That sludge is either burned or it's spread as fertilizer, and it goes right back into the environment, eventually into our oceans, into our fish, into our air, and we're exposed to all this amalgam waste that we can't get rid of. <clears throat> and these numbers are huge. People with amalgam fill and serve as hosts for mercury's passage back into our environment through the excretion of human waste and breathing. So it's not only coming out of our offices into the sewage system, it's just coming from people's normal elimination of mercury waste. When people are cremated, they don't take the mercury out before they cremate the body, so it goes into the atmosphere. That's a portion too. But we're putting in much more than coal burning fire plants, which are now have scrubbers and those kind of things on it. So when all these various pathways are accounted for, in the United States, we contribute roughly 28 and a half tons into the environment each year. So that's pretty, pretty significant, and we're paying for it. Uh, this is a uh, river in Massachusetts, and this is what the rivers in South Carolina look like. All this is contaminated, have mercury warnings on our fish, freshwater fish, coming out of these, these, our streams. And almost every one of them is marked with mercury advisories. 
So what I'm going to be talking to you about is how do we protect not only the environment outside our offices, but your personal environment, the environment of your team, the environment of your operatories, so that you're not creating a workery waste dump inside your office. So what do we do with this stuff, this contaminated materials we use once we take mercury out of somebody's mouth? What I do with mine is the grossly contaminated materials like rubber dams, cotton rolls, um, those kind of things, the gloves that I've had on. When I'm removing all that stuff, I take, take it off, fold up, take my gloves around it, and throw it in a little container that's sealed. And then this little container, at the end of the day, or sometimes maybe the end of the week, depending on how much is in that, then goes into a larger container that goes to a recycler. And I have to recycle this container about twice a year, two to three times a year, at a cost of uh, about $500. Now, when I'm doing that, I'm also making sure I'm wearing a little protection from the vapor. Um, actually, now we, we uh, and also we you have the auxiliary suction in place. I don't have this in that pictures, and I should. Because when you open this up, what's going to come out of it? Mercury vapor. And a lot of it. So we open it fast, dump it fast, close it fast. And have all our stuff running when we do that. <clears throat> now, for our wastewater, which from each office contains about a pound and a half of mercury per dentist per year, uh, we want everybody that's a member of this academy to pledge to have uh, separators. And it is a requirement for accreditation that you demonstrate you have a separator. And they're going to ask you to take a photograph of it and send it in. That only takes a half gram of mercury to contaminate a 10-acre lake to levels that will require all those warning signs not to eat the fish living in the lake. So you see, we've done a really good job of that in South Carolina, dumping our mercury in the water so we can't eat the fish. And then in the form of sludge, you see the spreader on farms are filled or incinerated. Another way it gets back into the environment. And we're the only industry in the United States, anyway, that's not required to prevent mercury waste from entering the environment. Sixty percent of mercury reaching treatment facilities is from our dental offices. And 28 tons of mercury is entering our environment per year because we all do not have separators. And this was a little program they did in South Carolina that I told you about. I got my little plaque to put on the wall, and uh, they said 20% gain in separator insulation was their goal. I told them that was a joke. And they didn't like me. They kicked me off. <laughs> so here's some examples of some amalgam uh, separators that are available to you, and you, most of you probably have them, but probably talking mostly of U.S. dentists here. Um, this one's a Reebok. Uh, this one is a smaller version for little offices, not Reebok, it's a different uh, manufacturer. Here's a better picture of the Reebok. I think this is actually Bill's separator in his office. Uh, this is the one I use, the one, this is the one in my office. Uh, this is a Canadian company, actually. Mars Company makes the boss. So there's different kinds, and you can pick one that's suitable you know, for your office, depending on how many operatories you have, how many dentists you have working, and the manufacturers can help you figure that out. Now, there's also the line cleaner you use is very important. Because if you use one that contains bleach, chlorine, it will increase the release of mercury from amalgam that's trapped in your lines before it gets to the separators. And this is a power lens product that contains chlorhexidine gluconate, which doesn't create an increase in the lease as much. There's also a company, while I'm thinking about it, and I'll have it later on the slides, called Mercon, that makes a line cleaner that will actually help reduce the mercury that's contaminating the lines. <clears throat> So which one is right for you, depending on, again, the size of your practice, how many chairs you'll be removing amalgam at a time. You want to think about how 
often you will need to change it. What's the exposure risk when your needs to be changed? How difficult is it to change? These are uh, de our dental companies send their technicians in to change out these separators and they don't have a clue what's in them. They go in with absolutely no protection on, change them out, there's got to be vapor being released as they do it, and the dental companies don't give them any training on that. The guy that does mine, I said, if you're going to go in there, you're going to put a mask on. And now I'll make him put on a coverall to cover up with. Or you're not going to do it. I'll have to go do it. But I'd rather pay him to do it. But I make him dress up to do it. He looks at me like I'm crazy. So uh, we should have exhibitors out there today that can help you with that if anybody needs to think about getting a separator. So where's all this mercury considered toxic? It's everywhere except if we put it in the form of amalgams in our mouths. Then it's perfectly safe according to the ADA and numerous other people who have an interest in the financial aspect of this fight. Now, the UNEP Treaty, United Nations Environmental Treaty, was just signed last year, this year, um, and they made a big deal that the U.S. was the first to ratify that treaty to tackle mercury pollution. Well, this treaty really is, says that we should be trying to phase out amalgam or mercury in dentistry and it was a fight to keep mercury in the treaty that in relationship to dentistry but it's not as strong as we probably would have liked it to be we would have liked it to say stop using it ban it but it hasn't done that but through this process of being involved with UNEP we've also been recognized as an organization that can help other countries to learn how to eliminate mercury in dentistry and we're developing a technical assistance program called TAP to help other countries learn how to and hopefully we'll be helping Canadians and the United States who are the most hard-headed ones to uh, begin to eliminate mercury in their countries. Uh, we're making some good progress down in Brazil. You'll probably hear more about that being discussed during meetings or hear people talking about it out in the halls. That's what that's all about. Uh, this is a letter from, um, that was written from Brazilian, from the Brazilians about our technical assistance program, uh, thanking us and for hopefully asking other people to financially support the academy to get this project off the ground. Because right now we are underfunded and we're seeking money uh, to hopefully make that happen. All right, so just a little humor here about mercury and fish. Everybody should know, probably knows Jesus there and where that story comes from. <laughs> All, right. All right. Now I'm going to move into what I think is very, very important because it is how we can protect our team members, we can protect ourselves as we remove um, mercury fillings. Dr. Omura, who's an MD, and he's an oncologist, and he has a PhD in acupuncture, he, he states that almost all disease, including cancer, is caused by an infection with a heavy metal component involved. All mercury silver fillings leak substantial amounts of mercury constantly. The amount increases with any kind of stimulation, and as a result, mercury from fillings produces the majority of human exposure to mercury. The International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology is extremely concerned about the anecdotal claims of safety by manufacturers and dental trade associations. They're at variance with the published, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to the contrary. The precautionary principle requires action once the possibility of harm exists. It does not require proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the case of heavy metal and xenobiotic exposure is both nearly impossible 
an unnecessary one, in our opinion. What you're seeing is mercury vapor coming off a 25-year-old silver amalgam filling in an extracted tooth. The background is a phosphorescent screen. The mercury vapor absorbs the fluorescent light, and you can see it as a shadow on the screen. This is mercury coming off a filling that was dipped in water that's the same temperature as the human body. This is a filling that was rubbed with a pencil eraser for just a few seconds. Like going to the hygienist and having her clean your teeth. These are not small amounts of mercury. If you can see it, it's more than 1,000 times higher than the Environmental Protection Agency will allow for the air that we breathe. What about the last time you went to the dentist and they drilled on your tooth? Here is the mercury vapor every time you raise the temperature to 110 degrees with hot coffee or warm water or even chewed on it. Mercury comes off fillings every time you stimulate them and that stimulation causes the mercury to continue to leak out of the fillings for an hour and a half at a minimum. Some people grind their teeth. Some people chew gum. That was Dr. Uh, David Kennedy's famous smoking tooth video. He's going. He will be speaking to you this afternoon on fluoride and biological treatment of periodontal disease. You get to know David. Uh, that's available on our website. You can buy buy it to hand out to people if you want to, or you can download it. So we're probably getting, everybody here is pretty much convinced that mercury from dental amalgam is fairly toxic. Uh, we've got studies showing it releases vapor at a rate of 12 micrograms a day. It's, a, it's inhaled into the bloodstream through the lungs. The EPA will define amalgam scrap as a biohazardous waste, so I guess it's okay to put that scrap in your teeth. Removing those silver mercury fillings is kind of a hazardous job. Um, if you're not protecting yourself, you're going to be inhaling the mercury vapor that's created and particulate that's created when you remove the amalgams. Eighty percent of that inhaled mercury is absorbed in the lungs. Any particulate that's uh, inhaled in the lungs stays in the lungs. And it's absorbed rapidly by the lungs with approximately 10 minutes of absorption, 30% of the mercury in the lungs is transferred to the blood. And if you really inhale a large amount, you can damage the lower parts of the bronchial tree and lung tissue. This would be, this would be something like in a case of an acute mercury poison. It had, it'd be very, very high numbers to give you acute mercury poisoning. So this is a chronic exposure that we're doing. It also will pass through the oral nasal mucosa in the base of the skull and gain direct entry to the brain. So Dr. Haley likes to say we're implanting mercury six inches from the brain. Does that make any sense? It's transported along nerve fibers toward the brain at a rate of 10 millimeters per day. Dr. Jeremy Caslow's an MD. He wrote it in a paper about the over the different types of effects mercury has when it gets into the body. You don't know where it's going to go. It's going to go to the weakest link it can attach to, depending on the person's immune system, what else is going on. But it can produce reproductive effects, it lowers progesterone, leading to infertility, infertility, miscarriage, premature birth, low libido, and PMS. Sounds like my dental assistant. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Strike that. Don't put that in there. She's not here. But no. Now, we know there are of studies that show that the females that work in dental office have more miscarriages, have problems with fertility, um, premature birth, birth, all this, but nobody's ever connected the dots. Why? Well, this is why. Now, mercury also displaces minerals in the body. And these essential minerals, when they're displaced, can lead to, if it's magnesium, high blood pressure, cramps, chocolate cravings, irregular heartbeats. For iron, 
It can be part of the anemia and fatigue that comes with mercury poisoning. The other factor is mercury gets in the cells, it affects the mitochondria, which are our energy sources, and the mitochondria don't produce as much ATP, or it actually can cause mitochondrial death. In the place is copper, also leading to anemia, thyroid dysfunction, impaired digestion, creating large dysbiosis in the gut when mercury gets affects the bacteria in the gut. Liver enzymes can be impaired, leading to easy bruising. It can displace zinc, which lowers our testosterone and progesterone, low libido, loss of appetite, PMS, acne, and skin disorders. And this is more sounding like me. You add a little anger in there. This would have been me. And iodine. We've got tons of thyroid dysfunction in the United States. Uh, part of that's fluoride, and some of it can be from mercury. You'll hear more about that from David this afternoon. As far as digestive disorders, a lot of our patients will say they, you know, they have a lot of gut problems. Well, mercury kills the essential bacteria in the gut, allowing an overgrowth of yeast and parasites. You'll hear more of this from Chris Shea this afternoon, too. His intestinal metal detox will help to correct some of that problem. Of course, the brain. What mercury does in the brain is inhibits neurotransmitters, dopamine, that we need for controlling pain and well-being. So what happens? We get a bunch of depressed dentists who commit suicide more than the general population. Depresses serotonin for relaxation. You think you don't get as good as sleep. You don't feel good about yourself. Adrenaline, again, energy and stamina. And one of the most common complaints patients are going to tell you is I have chronic fatigue. I don't have any energy. Noradrenaline for melatonin sleep cycles. <clears throat> nope, too fast. In the blood, mercury can bind to hemoglobin, resulting in less oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells, less oxygen reaching the tissues. The body may compensate by increasing hemoglobin. Um, I'm an example of that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So, for you guys have been practicing a while and haven't been taking precautions to control your environment, is your office a mercury waste dump? Uh, you, can, you can rent a Jerome mercury vapor analyzer to test the environment, and the company there you can rent it from is there. If you find you have contaminated surfaces, you can clean them with a flower of sulfur or Mercon decontamination products to decontaminate surfaces and autoclaves. And I'll give you the Mercon information in a little bit later. It'll be on the slide. You need to get rid of all unused amalgams in your office. Uh, send it to the recycler. Make the dental company take it back. Do something with it. If you've got carpeting and treatment errors, uh, you've got to get it out of there. I promise you it's contaminated. Um, you try to replace it with hard surface floors that are easily maintained that can be mopped. Any drapes you've got hanging or other fabrics in the offices, upholstered chairs, probably need to go. And you can test them with an analyzer. Just give them a little rub, see what it reads. Most of the time the readings will go up if they've been there a while. So, I used to do this part of the lecture and I would tell you about myself, not telling you it was myself. About halfway through, I'd rip my coat and tie and shirt off and I had my Superman shirt off. I didn't know if you Canadians could handle that, so <laughs> since this is my first international lecture, I decided to behave myself this time. So, I'm not gonna do that, so I'm telling you right up front, this was me, okay? I practice like Superman. No protection. That damn mercury can't hurt me. Didn't even know it could because they told me in dental school it couldn't. There's nothing wrong with it. So I got out of school about 30-something years ago. I started a solo practice. My wife was my assistant, my only employee. 
We uh, waited on patients to come in, and Superwoman, my wife, worked chair side. We didn't have anything else to do, so we did get pregnant. <laughs> she had a miscarriage. Didn't think anything of it. Well, that happens. Hated it. Still hate it. But it happened. So I went along and practiced about 12 years, same way, putting in mercury, taking mercury out every day, cutting teeth in half to pull them, exposing myself every day. Now, my wife only worked in my office for two years. Because then I started making money, and I sent her home. Got her out of there. Um, so I went to a uh, lecture by Dr. Bill Strupp. I don't know if you're aware of him. He's a fantastic restorative dentist. Did not place mercury fillings. And this was back in the old days. When you went to lecture hall, he had four stacks of slides up to the roof, literally, in the back of the room. Slides after slide after slide. Uh, taking out mercury, showing us the grunge that was on them, showing us the cracks in the teeth, showing us how bad or just a restorative feeling it is. So I came home from that lecture, and like most dentists, I'm all fired up. So I walked into the office Monday morning, and I told my team members, one who's still, the one who said this still works with me today, and I said, Kim, take all our mercury and get rid of it. And we had been exposed to some patients by then who had insisted on us not using amalgam. And, I, of course, I tried to talk them out of it. But uh, Kim's a little country girl, good, good Christian girl. No, she'd worked for me since she was 14, uh, keeping my kids. Never heard her curse in her life. And she goes, well, it's about damn time. <laughs> so uh, we cold turkey stopped placing amalgams. Um, but I was still Superman, okay? I'm still practicing the same way. I've had two children by now. Then my wife suddenly starts having all these weird symptoms and goes to, I send her to a pain specialist I had been working with with some of my TMJ patients. He told, and because another doctor had said she had fibromyalgia, and I'm going, well, nobody even knows what that is. So I sent to this guy, and he did treat fibromyalgia patients. He decided he'd test her for heavy metal toxicity. Guess what my wife had? Mercury poisoning. So she got treated, got better. His old Superman just working his butt off, and he's not going to a doctor anyway. So after about 15 years in practice, I started having so much pain in my thumbs, I couldn't... I couldn't hold a can of beer at the end of the day. I started having pain in my joints. I was beginning to think, I'm going to have to find something else to do. I don't know how long I can keep doing this. I got mean. My temper was short. I was probably depressed. Guess what I had? Mercury poisoning. Same doctor diagnosed me. All right, so I did my chelation treatment for the first time. I got my levels down. Pain in my thumb went away. Pain in my joints went away. I got back to my normal sweet self. <laughs> I was still practicing like a dummy as Superman. Then I found IOMT three years later. I started finally using, after exposing myself for three more years. Now, I'd stopped doing amalgams, remember? I was just taking them out to save mercury protocols. And I got Bill Virtue to thank for that. Twenty years, had my first heart attack at, oh, uh, God, what was I, 48, 47 years old. Why did I have a heart attack, guys? Paranondi study Bill talked about. Mercury damages, damages the endothelial lining of the vessels, causes plaque buildup. That was my only reason for a heart attack. I was eating healthy. I was, had long quit using a whole bunch of alcohol, um, a little bit of red wine. Here I drink a lot of red wine at these meetings, but a little bit of red wine. 
eating healthy, <clears throat> not a, uh, too much of a family history. I really think that's where my heart trouble came from. Mark Houston has written another paper, which you ought to download and read, uh, Role of Mercury Toxicity in Hypertension and Cardiovascular Disease. Amazing all the facts he brings in. So then, guess what? I started having arthritic-type pains again, and another guy was getting a little mean again. So I said, you know, I better go get this stuff checked again. And my levels were back up. Now, did my levels get back up in those two years, or did I never really get it out? We don't know. Okay? We don't really know. This time I did a little different chelation, and there's, this is a doctor's data test. This is a provoked urine test. Uh, this is what it is. is yeah. yeah, okay. And it's showing, that's, this showing after a couple months, I was down to 43 and I started at 80 something. So the mercury's at 43. The other stuff's up too. Uh, this one is after chelation, I was down to 1.1. 1 .1. Or three, under 3. Point, down to 2, sorry. Oh, wait, where's the hair? They're too little on my thing. That one's the mercury after uh, doing some treatment. I know, I just can't see it on my computer. But anyway, chelation worked for me. Made a difference in how I felt. Now, chelation means when patients come to you and talk about chelation, a lot of them are naturally trying to kill eat themselves with natural stuff like Bill talked about. Cilantro, chlorella, clays, uh, all kinds of things. And they may have uh, somebody helping them, or they may not have anybody helping them, but most of them haven't even been diagnosed. They just think they have mercury toxicity. They may or they may not. And they can get themselves in a little bit of trouble treating themselves. In the States, if dentists treat them for chelation, we can get in big time trouble because then we can be accused of practicing medicine without a license. So don't write a prescription for a challenge test. Don't write them DMSA and go tell them to get a challenge test. Find a physician to work with or a naturopath to work with that can do that. Now in Canada it may be a little different. You'd have to ask Dave, uh, but in the States, be very careful of that. I give them a lot of advice. I use Chris's products. Uh, I use his screening test, which you'll hear about, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I do not literally diagnose or treat mercury poisoning. <clears throat> um, this is um, the test, a test from neuroscience. You can also, also have my glutathione tested. It was low. And glutathione is one of our major antioxidants that will help get rid of mercury or heavy metals. Uh, liposomal glutathione, Bill takes, I do too. There's controversy whether it does any good to take it because it's not readily absorbed. Liposomal is the better resorbed kind uh, when you take it. So all that was low. So the ADA tells us um, in their best management practices what we should be doing with the mercury if it's in our office environment. If we spill it or to help prevent the vapor, they just tell us we should be well ventilated to prevent the buildup of mercury vapor. So I guess they want us to open our windows and stick a fan in them, pretty much. Um, that the patient treatment and work areas should be monitored for mercury vapor on a routine basis. And in the event of mercury spills, you should bring in an industrial hygienist trained in the use of mercury vapor analyzers to do the monitoring. They have this written down. Those mercury, uh, to actually monitor the mercury vapor is very, very expensive. Just the analyzers, the drone analyzers, will be a big investment. Dr. Young, raise your hand, Matty. And I'll tell you about a study that Dr. Young and I did with Dave and Bill. Um, he has a virtual lab. Every room is monitored, goes to a computer. Amazing system. And we're getting lots of data out of his office. 
But a system like that would cost you, what, eighty, hundred thousand dollars right, man? $350,000. He got a little deal. <clears throat> so it's not feasible for us to do that, is what I'm saying. The smart thing is don't let it build up. And this is just uh, what the ADA says we're supposed to have, an example of a mercury spill kit. But if you're in any other industry but ours, and you spill the amount of mercury the size of a pencil in a school, or the size of about a quarter in most places, you're supposed to evacuate the building and bring in a hazmat team to clean it up. But we can spill it around, throw it around in the office all day long. So, you'll see Dennis in the state saying we're mercury free. We're practicing mercury free. How many dentists do y'all think practice mercury free? Fifty, sixty percent. Anybody else? Zero. Exactly right. How can you practice mercury free when we're dealing with this all day long? None of us can say we're mercury free dentists. Uh, they got on the bill and told him he couldn't say he, he was didn't have mercury. I said, well, don't you have fluorescent light bulbs? There's mercury in them. Well, get rid of the fluorescent light bulbs. I mean, you as you begin to attract these holistic patients that know more about mercury than you'll ever think you probably ever know. Um, but that's the way I felt when I got started. They'll look up and say, you got fluorescent light bulbs. I mean, you're going to need to get the fluorescent. I'm serious. The fluorescent light bulbs are gone out of my office. I just built a new one. There are no fluorescent light bulbs in it. Okay. So. We can't be mercury free, you know, if y'all can see that too good, but you know what it is. We've just taken the mercury filling out, and right over the blood supply of that tooth is just dark black. So the mercury not only is eliminated as vapor, do you not think it's going into the blood supply of the body through that tooth when you see that? Of course it was. Do I have all the mercury out of that tooth? I don't know. I got most of it out. I got the actual metal I can see. But what's in that black stain? I don't know. I can't go get much more. Because then I'm going to be in the nerve of that tooth. So. <clears throat> All right. So the ADA protocol for mercury protection is well ventilate the room and wear a mask. Well, these little masks, they protect from saliva splatter and you swallow in the saliva and maybe viruses and bacteria they do not protect from mercury vapor and probably they don't protect from mercury particulate and we have shown that if you wear one of those and wear a couple procedures particularly it actually builds up on that mask now you got the particles right there that you're breathing in with every breath there's absolutely no protection from mercury there this is Dr. Robin Warwick. This is David's daughter. Um, Y'all all know David I'm talking about. The guy in the Hawaiian shirt and the Canadian back there. He's not there right now, but he's usually sitting right there. Um, she just graduated from dental school about two years ago. Her senior year in dental school, her senior project was to study mercury vapor exposure during dental student training in amalgam removal. She not only graduated from dental school, which is a miracle, <laughs> she got this published in the Journal of Occupational Medicine and Toxicology. So she measured exposure to mercury vapor while removing mercury fillings in a dental school lab, you know, while they were the didactic lab. So they're plugging it in, then they're cutting it out so they don't have to go buy another tooth or whatever. So they were putting them in and cutting them out when they were up there. And she was able to measure levels of water and suction, suction only, and cutting high and dry. Now, at my dental school in South Carolina, they just built a new one, and I was there um, a couple of months ago walking through with a young guy that's going to come work for me. You know, their lab, they don't have any water, and they don't have any suction. None at all. I was so... This, this was at uh, University of Alberta. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, that's where she went to school. 
So when water and suction were used, levels were below the threshold of 25 micrograms per meter cubed for an eight-hour period set by the Alberta Occupational Health and a lot of OSHA and EPA agencies in the United States. And I'll tell you how they got that in a little bit. Uh, but basically how they got that number is they determined 26 was bad, so they said we'll make it 25. Now, that doesn't mean it was zero exposure. That just meant it was a little bit under 25. So with suction only or cutting dry, levels exceeded the threshold by 8% and 30% respectively. So she definitely showed that they were getting exposed in dental school to mercury vapor. Now, this was a uh, joint project chemical specific health consultation for joint EPA and ATSDR. ATSDR is a part of the Centers for Dental Control in the United States. Um, Centers, for Dental, Centers for Disease Control in the United States, excuse me. On a national mercury cleanup policy work group, action levels for elemental mercury spill. So what they were trying to do is figure out, okay, if you broke that thermometer in the school, you broke it in a residential setting, Versus an industrial setting. When do you need to come in and pull in this hazmat team and get this place cleaned up or clear the building or whatever? That's what they were trying to do. So both the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry and the Environmental Protection Agency, they developed health guideline values, HGVs, uh, for inhaled mercury vapor. And they based them on a 1983 study of workplace exposures that Foyer did. And these workers were exposed in their workplace to mercury vapors. They came from three different types of industry, fluorescent tube manufacturers, chloralkali plants, bleach places, making bleach, and acetylhalide products, and I don't know what they're used for. And they report a lowest observed adverse effect of 26 microns per meter cubed, and this was over 15 years, and these people were having tremors in their hands. That was uh, what they picked up. So they say, okay, if 26 causes tremors, they can have 25. Real scientific there, isn't it? Um, then they took and they extrapolated numbers and defined a minimal risk level for chronic exposures, in other words, working more than 365 days to mercury, of 0.2 micrograms per meter cubed. Well, for a dental environment, I say we have pretty chronic exposures. And if you want to put a number on a safe exposure to mercury, which doesn't exist, it's that 0.2 number. And we're going to show you that what we do, we're totally exposed thousands of times over that number. Um, then they, uh, in the workplace average, they adjusted it somehow, did some math, uh, and then divided by an uncertainty factor of 30, and they came up with this number of uh, 10 for human variability to account for something. And I tell you, I don't understand what all that means, uh, but I think it means you're not supposed to be exposed to mercury in the workplace. So these are other numbers that you find posted for workplace limits. Um, OSHA. The permissible exposure limit for an eight-hour day is 100 micrograms per meter cubed. For the NIOS H, um, time-weighted average of eight hours is 50 micrograms. For the NIOS ceiling, it's 100. They go with folks on that. And then for the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, they're down to 25 micrograms per meter cubed. So they're all over the place. We really don't. And the way they get these, or the way they do in industry, they go into an industry and they study it, and they say, well, this is what you're able to do. Because when you've got a vat of mercury, a football field long in a chloralkali plant, some vapor's going to be coming off of that. So there's no way they're going to get those numbers down to zero or 0.2. So they've determined where they can get them down to. Now, the workers in those environments are not walking around their street clothes, I assure you, and breathing the air in there. They're wearing protective clothing. And when the levels get 
to 50% of their max levels, they'll shut the process down, clear the building until they can get the levels back down. I mean, they're very careful with this stuff. So the World Health Organization, Mercury and Healthcare, uh, a policy they wrote, I think it's on the website, they've stated that studies suggest that mercury may have no threshold below which some adverse effects do not occur. So basically those allowable levels mean nothing. You want to have zero exposure. So as a dentist, how long have you been exposed to the hazards of mercury? How long have you been working? You're like me, worked 15 years before you even had a clue. Um, but you've been exposed since the first mercury filling was placed in your mouth, if, any, if you have, still have any or ever had any. So on the first day you stepped into the teaching lab in dental school, or walked into the building, actually, probably, Dr. Warwick has shown you were exposed to mercury. So the ocean limits not to exceed 100 micrograms. Okay. Go forward. Okay. Well, when you open an amalgam capsule, for those of you who, how many of you know came out of school and didn't place amalgam? I mean, some of you, a lot of you are young enough to do that. That's awesome. That's great. Well, I'm old. I'm too old for that. So <laughs> I opened a lot of amalgam capsules, breathing 400 micrograms. Clean out chair side traps when they got cleaned out back then. It was probably more than that coming out of mine. Um, drilling with no water spray, which happens occasionally, 1,200 micrograms, and we've got some other studies showing even higher numbers. Drilling with water, we're getting it on down a little, the 100 to 460 micrograms. Drilling with water and suction, which is where most normal dentists work, yeah. We can stay below that 50 microgram number, but it's 50, 15 to 40 micrograms, and I'll show you a little bit. We've got peak numbers that don't get recorded because these are averages that go much higher when we're doing that with, with water and suction. And how about polishing? How about our hygienists? I know we've got some hygienists out there, right? When you're polishing your patient's amalgams, you're creating 500 to 900 micrograms per meter cubed. Now... What my hygienists do for my patients who have mercury fillings and haven't had them out, and believe it or not, I have some of those in my practice, they put on a mercury vapor mask. And a patient kind of looks at them up there, and they tell them, you know, your fillings have mercury in them, and, it, and they don't polish the fillings either. They just polish around them, but they do not polish the surface of the fillings. But... And they tell them, I'm going to make sure I'm not going to breathe the vapor that can be increased as I polish your fillings. Now, you would think most patients would say, how about you just don't polish them and we'll go get them out? And some do. But some just don't have a clue and just keep on going. But that's what we do in my hygiene practice, my hygiene side. So, you have a risk that a patient and the dental personnel during amalgam removal primarily due to the aerosol of mercury vapor and particulate that is created. So our real everyday risk as dentists and team members is over 100 micrograms per meter cubes. That's a dangerous level above maximum exposures established by the EPA number of 4.8. But these exposure limits mean nothing. And But this is right in our immediate breathing zone. We're close to the patient. We're in our environment. It's going to get on our clothes. It's going everywhere. So how can we minimize the risk? How can we protect our team members, our pregnant team members? That one on the right's a rabbit. She's uh, now had her fourth baby. That was her third baby. And she's homeschooling now instead of working chairside hygiene. Um, so how do we practice mercury safe? Everybody okay? Probably get this done for lunch. So these are our doctor team and patient protection procedures for mercury safe practice. The ADA method is no protection, none at all. Our current mercury protection procedures for the IMT are we want to supply a nasal air supply for our patient. We'll talk about that. We want to use a non-latex damp material and nitrile gloves for our team members. We're going to place a saliva ejector under the dam to help the nitrile dams are the, actually the polyvinyl dams 
and the nitrile gloves are more resistant to vapor than regular latex, but it's not zero. Okay, it's not total protection. Vapor can go through. We're gonna put some eye protection for our patients. <clears throat> We're gonna advise you using a little suction device called cleanup, which I'll show you that. We're gonna have some big auxiliary suctions with mercury filters built into them that are helping get the vapor out of the room faster and in particular. Um, a tack air ionizer may be something you wanted to include and we'll go over those. Um, it's, a, it's a device you can put in your room to help put charges on the particles and draw them to a plate on the wall and get them out of the air faster. We're gonna wear some type of mercury vapor respirator mask for the dentist and the assistant. And this is kind of what the setup looks like. First you gotta have a great, great doctor. There's one right there. And a great assistant, and she really not doesn't walk around PMSing all the time. I was teasing. Um, we're using a polyvinyl dam, or if you can find nitrile dam. Some people can find nitrile material, but I haven't been able to find it. It's actually a polyvinyl material. We're using this device called a cleanup. This part is, um, you, you keep this, you don't throw them away, unfortunately. I wish this part was disposable. These little... Um, Membranes that go around the tooth to help control the particulate and get it to going up into the cleanup and into our traps uh, are disposable pieces. Nasal air source on the patient. We're doing some uh, research on ops. So this is just, of course, a nitrous mask uh, hooked up to an oxygen supply. You could also have a nasal mask in. Uh, Wazoo has one that he's with him here that we're experimenting with. Or you could hook this up to a scuba tank or an air tank. It doesn't have to be oxygen. It just needs to be another source of air rather than the room air. And let the patient breathe that while you're taking the mercury out. And we want to take this stuff out as quick as we can. Um, get it out, get it cleaned up, and get rid of all this stuff. These masks have mercury vapor filters and they have particulate filters on them. So there's two types of filters on these, on these masks. Um, the particulate filter is an outer filter. So now this actually protects mostly from, for vapor. I mean, you can see we've got uncovered skin surfaces. So there's a possibility that particulate can get on these skin surfaces. So maybe we should be covering the patients better. And I'll go into that a little later. We got a study that shows we should be doing that. We got eye protection on the patient. Slide jet again under the dam to collect those vapors. Now for the, uh, the dentist, rather than those mercury vapor masks, you can have a positive pressure mask. And this is Dr. Call, this is Jack. And he has this run into an auxiliary air tank. Um, you know, you get you can get an air tank filled with scuba shop for ten bucks, or you can get an oxygen bottle for what forty five, fifty bucks. So that, that's a this does not have to be oxygen. This just has to be not breathing the room air. So there's more more than one ways to skin this cat. Okay, auxiliary suctions. We want to have these position. This is uh, Dr. Young's. This is an IQ air. We're going to have this position right up in this area. We're going to put it right in front of the, our work zone and let it pull as much vapor and particulate down into that trap that's, that's in the bottom of the filter. Uh, this is the, what the IQ air looks like. We, um, we have run tests on these, and we've got mercury vapor going in, and we don't have any mercury vapor coming out. They are very, very effective in cleaning the air. That's, I mean, you really have to test each individual office because it depends on airflow and uh, whatever, but, I mean, it doesn't hurt just to leave them on, but, you know, for a while. But generally, we were taking, when we did this study, we had two running, which I'll go over. We were cutting out a lot of, a lot of them out, and it was taking, what, about eight minutes, ten minutes, right? About ten minutes to get the room levels back down, and we were running two of them. 
Okay. And well, we were cutting out a lot of stuff. And I'll go over that. Might be after lunch, but I'll go over that. Okay. Um, there's also a Den Air back. This one, this is a little less expensive model. It works also. So I don't think it's a yes, yeah, a Den Air back. Okay. And these, we you have exhibitors down there. This proved to be the most important piece of equipment as far as protecting the environment of the operator. Clean it up quicker. Okay. Get it cleaned up. Again, use nitrile gloves versus regular latex gloves because they do uh, prevent less vapor from going through. Some other products you can get. Uh, this is a company that makes a hand cleanser to, uh, that traps mercury. And this stuff works pretty good. I'm not sure what's in it. There's probably a lot of sulfur in it, something to bind the mercury up. I put this on my hands before the procedure under the gloves because I know some mercury vapor can come through the gloves to help trap that mercury um, and to clean the mercury. You can use it to clean surfaces. You can dilute it to clean surfaces. Uh, but this stuff is effective and works very well. So we know that mercury is very poisonous. I don't think anybody's going to be doing this in the room after today's lecture. And hopefully you're not going to be breathing this, vapor and particulate, that's coming off your amalgam. Okay, so... Now, if you're doing accreditation, that's what accreditation is looking for, okay? Um, I'm not sure if they require all that equipment. I don't think they require the tact air, which I'll go over in a minute. I didn't even have it up there, did I? I have it in this part. So that's what we're looking for. Now, so I was practicing for a couple of years with doing these procedures. I was also practicing a couple of years probably that I wasn't doing those procedures between my chelation therapies, okay? But I got checked again after practicing like this for about 10 years. I wasn't as high in mercury, but I still had some levels of about 35, okay? So it made me question whether we were doing enough I posed a question, Maddie's brain kicked in, and we designed a study to test how good our stuff is. This has been turned in as a scientific review um, for the new members or probably even members been around a long time. We have a procedure in the academy called scientific review. Uh, members can turn in anything, procedure or product that they want to have a, have a stamp, kind of like a stamp of approval on, or just to confirm that the science we've done is, is valid. And this scientific review is going to be voted on tonight in our board meeting. It's been provisionally accepted by the committee that looks at it, and the scientific review is based on this study. Uh, it's on our website. You can read it. If you want to come to the board meeting tonight, it ought to be some fireworks. Because what I'm going to propose to you that we should be doing is not something you're going to want to do. And we'll talk about that when I get to it. Okay? But the title of the study, and we may change the title, and probably will change the title after we saw the results we get. But the title, original title, was The Efficacy of the International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology Engineering Controls Used During Removal of Mercury Silver dental restorations. So what we did is Matt and I and Matt's wife, we got together one night, we cut a lot of preps in type of dot teeth. Um, Susie triturated them, Matt cut them, Susie triturated them, I packed them. We had two machines running trying to clear the air out. We had Jerome analyzers going couldn't even measure the vapor that we were creating. And we wore suits and protected ourselves and no telling how much exposure we actually had, but and how bad we exposed Matt's office. But <laughs> we, we did a lot of them. And we did six sessions removing the occlusal buckle, mercury silver fillings, four from the right and four from the left. So each session we removed eight mercury fillings. Okay? We would take an engineering control. We started with them all on. And then we would take a control off uh, each time. Now, we measured three things. 
we measured vapor. And the way we measured vapor is we had uh, a tube right by on our shoulders here, and the tube ran to a vapor analyzer. So we had real-time measurements of vapor. We measured particulate in vapor. We had another tube that had a little suction pump on it, and it had a little uh, filter in it. So it was, the vapor was going through there, and it was catching the particulate, and it was being absorbed onto uh, cotton, right? And then we had that read by our a lab, and we had industrial hygienists working on our project, and that's the way they test stuff. And then we analyzed that data. And then we did surface wipes of specific areas, and we couldn't test every surface because we spent $20,000 on getting this stuff analyzed. So we just didn't have enough money to, like, test the back of our neck or test the dentist. We didn't wipe the dentist. We did the assistant. We did the patient. And we down to the knees. But we, we could have tested surfaces, hard surfaces, like the countertop behind us. And we, we just didn't have no money to do all that. So all we really know is we know where we tested, everywhere we tested, there was particulate. All right, so then we would start with all our stuff on, everything we had on. We had the tack there, and I'll show you that next so you'll understand what that is. We had the tack there, we were using the cleanup with rubber dams. Um, we had our auxiliary suctions going, we were using our water spray, um, and uh, then we had our standard, we'd switched over to our standard dental suction when we took off the cleanup, and then we cut high and dry, eight fillings out. So this is our first control, this is the tack there, this sits on the countertop, and it has a fan in it that runs, it generates um, ions, a charge, charges the mercury particles, then they go to this plate, and there's a cord that connects them. So one's positive, one's negative. I never remember which one's which, or what charge gets on the mercury, and it sucks a particulate up to there. You can't see it, it's just happening. This is our setup, this is our dummy we used. We had a dummy head, we had a rubber dam on. Uh, here's our big auxiliary suction in here. Uh, Maddie's left-handed, so he's on that side of the chair, and I'm on this side of the chair. And the patient's covered in, uh, we use a Tyvek sheet so that we could cover the clothes and we could change the sheet every time to get our surface samples off that sheet. So we weren't recontaminating. You know, we were cleaning, had a clean surface each time we started. Then we removed the cleanup um, and just went down the line. This is the kind of data we got from our mercury vapor data. And um, just to show you that, and I'll show you some graphs of all this stuff put together for us. So we were, this was mercury vapor from the uh, highly, highly sensitive machine that we were using that was donated to us. So here's a little bit of what we got. Now, with all controls in place, which is the way an IOMT dentist would be, hopefully practicing, um, we had on this system, labor, you know, this was the part that was being breathed, would be breathed, particulate and vapor, we were picking up 3.3 micrograms per millicule. Our peaks for just vapor was 1.3. But when we added particulate to it, it increased. Hmm. Interesting. Our average of total vapor um, was 160. And these were the total vapor of each two sessions. Okay? We had one session and then we did another one. So two readings to get that average. That's total vapor. Now, how did I get total vapor? Because I don't know if that's an acceptable thing I can put into a published study. But we had these time waiters. So we took about uh, eight. I think the first one took 12 minutes to get eight restorations out, okay? Well, we didn't just breathe the average vapor, did we? If we were breathing out unprotected, we didn't just breathe only 1.3 micrograms, the average vapor, but we were able to total vapor. The total vapor release was 160.5 micrograms during that 12-minute period. So if we breathe in 80% of it and then exhale I breathe in 100% of that and only exhaled 20% of it. We got to breathe in 80% of that number. That was our real exposure in my brain. That might not be true, but that's the way I looked at it. 
So that's why that, that's what total vapor is. Um, the particulate, the highest particulate samples we found were on the routinely throughout every every session. The highest numbers of uh, particulate, which was surface area, okay, settled onto the countertop, was on the assistant's knee and on the patient's chest. And with all our controls, look what the patient got. 340 micrograms on the bib, maybe, but, you know, the bib, the collared shirt sticks up or the bib slips and they take and move it around. So there's a potential of contaminating your patient with 350 micrograms of mercury on their chest. And of course, this is just the assistance need for the first amalgam of the day. How about for the rest of them during the day? That just accumulates all day long for every procedure you do. All right, so our patient who now leaves the office with mercury all over their shirt, or if late in the day, maybe they go pick up their young child from daycare, that immediately jumps in their arms and buries their head on their mother's shirt. Now that child's just been exposed to some mercury, right? Doesn't that make sense? Okay. All right, so we started taking things off, and pretty much as we take things off, numbers literally went up. Okay? Now we get down to, with the cleanup and the tact air removed, and we're still using our suction, big suction. Now, Dave Ward's a genius, and he grafted all this stuff for us. So, <clears throat> this, this would be where we have everything on, okay? And then we take the cleanup off. I mean, excuse me, we take the tack tear off. Then we take the cleanup off. Then we take uh, and, and replace it with a standard dental suction, okay? And then we go from up to here where we've taken the auxiliary suction off. So this is where, this is with water, okay, and suction. This is where most dentists practice, right in here, all right? And this is for what the assistant was average mercury vapor. So this is what being breathed, no particular in this sample, at 6.66. Then we take away uh, the suction, we're cutting the water, and then we cut and dry. It just literally goes up. Okay, for almost everything we look at. This is the dentist vapor for the left amalgam removal, not quite as linear. Um, we did notice as we were doing this experiment that if I was using, I was assistant, Maddie was a dentist, if I was cleaning his mirror off for him by spraying water and air on it, he was getting more exposure than I was. <laughs> so I just kept trying to blow it over there at Maddie. <laughs> But we didn't notice that. I mean, it was, it was kind of strange. You know, he was working on a site, a maxillary tooth, where he needed his mirror clean. As the assistant was cleaning the mirror, his vapor readings got higher than the assistant's. We were moving it his way. <clears throat> These are uh, peak levels for the assistant. Now, peak levels are higher, okay? Now, this is the point two line. So everything's above the point two. Why do we have that dip? We don't really know. But that was kind of strange dip, a little anomaly. It didn't happen all the time. Mercury peak levels um, on the right side. Stay pretty low, lower than shot up as we took more stuff away. Now this is with particulate and vapor. All right, so this is another, another the tube we had, this vacuum pump we had on our chest capturing it and then it was sent off to a, a lab and analyzed. Um, so this is, uh, and this is time, how long it took, each session how long it took, time-wise, is this line. And you can see a steady progression as we took controls away, and these are logarithmic graphs, so look at the numbers, how much they're changing, look, look at them when they shoot up, okay? And this kind of showed this kind of showed us that the cleanup was really more effective than we kind of thought it was. We got a lot of, a lot of people who don't use the cleanup; they don't think it works, and it's kind of a pain because you got to, you know, it's another visually it's in your way. You got to work within that little zone for a little while. Um, but actually, this, the data shows it does work. It helps control particulate, especially on particulate. 
in vapor. There's a jump from there to there when we took it off. So it, it does help with particulate. Patient peak particulate, because we're exposing our patient. We went from 330, took off the tight care, to 340, took off the cleanup. Boom. Look what it did. Went from 340 to 1100. We're coating our patients with particulate. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it would do that. When we move the tack there, it would do that. And um, I, I don't know. Um, we don't. You know, we weren't trying to really prove products. We were just trying to see what happened. Generally, generally everything was linear. But sometimes to take the tack there off, they drop down. And we really couldn't figure it out. I don't know if we just overpowered the tack there. We followed our auxiliary suctions. Um, but we had that happen about twice in the data. Yeah, I and mean, we don't know why. You know, it, what this study has done is opened up a lot of uh, questions. Um, what I really think is done is it, 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 we should be doing more in barrier protection, and I'm going to go over that. Okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, let's hold questions to the end. If we have time for lunch, we'll have them so we can get everybody mics in. Okay. Not hurt. We're gonna have time. And then this was assistant peak mercury. And here again, we took off. Uh, this time we went up, and then it went down. So this was kind of a crazy slide too. And these these were the peak mercury particulates that we found. And these were these were the surface samples on the knee and whatever. Um, and then we got one in here back to vapor for the dentist. And this was this was again the total mercury vapor slide. So during the first session, we created that much vapor. We took the tack there off, but this you know we did this one quicker than this one too. There was time we we got a little quicker as we went, and then we started taking controls off, and we see we just created more vapor. But I think the difference in these two was created by the amount of time. And that could be why we've seen the dip in the other ones, too. Because if you go back and look at our time, we were, we were significantly better, started working together a little better, and we got faster. <clears throat> so that might be our reason. Um, and then the system there. But you see everything just climbs, 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 climbs. And if you're at a regular dentist, you're, you know, you're exposed, big exposure. So... There have been previous studies that have established that dentists and their team members are exposed to mercury vapor and mercury particulate. Uh, Hirsch, Clarks, and Miles, and Goldsmith back in 89 showed mercury vapor is absorbed through the skin at concentrations of 880 to 2,440 micrograms. Now, we weren't getting those high figures until we started turning off the water and cutting high and dry. And we sure weren't exposed 27 to 43 minutes. We're quicker than that. So... And I'm kind of stating that because we have not found a perfect barrier material that, that stops vapor and particulate. Okay? All of them are leak a little vapor. But I don't think it's going to round long enough, and we haven't tested really as we're wearing it what's under it. Is it getting through in the operator? We're testing it on a bench. So we... We don't know what a perfect material is for barrier protection. Now, um, Nemo and Worley and Martin showed dentists inhale particulate material during the removal of silver fillings. Well, that seems pretty obvious because our data shows the mercury, vapor, and particulate samples were higher than just the vapor. So there's particulate in that stuff floating around, too. <laughs> And in Richardson, in an article assessing the occupational risk for mercury particulates, he states, and you heard him say that in that video, that was Mark Richardson in that first video, it is apparent that the single largest source of mercury exposure to the practicing dentist is the removal of old amalgam fillings. The dose of mercury contained in the amalgam particulate inhaled with the removal of just a single small filling far exceeds that associated with the inhalation of mercury vapor contained within the general dental operatory air over the course of an entire week. So he's basically saying is in our ambient air in our offices, you're going to have more mercury readings than if you walk out in the parking lot. 
even if we're, so how long should you run that filter? <laughs> you probably ought to have it on. You probably should have a filter on of some type all day long and just leave it on. Maybe even all night long. And there's, I use a whole room filter that sits in the corner that's never turned off. It's not the big high auxiliary just to keep that air circulating and cleaned. Okay? And these are the references for those studies that I just quoted. So, what were our results in that study? So, if all controls in place, the dentist, assistant, and patient are exposed to mercury vapor and particulate. Particulate and vapor is inhaled, and I probably should say may be absorbed through the skin. We didn't prove that. We haven't tested that. Could be absorbed through the skin. Especially if that particulate gets on your skin and stays there all day long, then you have potential for exposure. Or gets on your pants leg and goes right through the fabric of your pants or your assistant's scrubs, stays there all day long, you're going to have exposure. <clears throat> and these are just some of those samples of particulate peaks. These are peaks. So, like I said, assistant got 2.9 on her knee, patient 330. Uh, as we started taking things off, you start seeing these numbers go up. There's a 340. 33 now on assistant's knee. Drop down a little bit there, I don't know why. We're way up on the patient. Maybe we just got more on the patient on that one. Or maybe my knee moved. Maybe I positioned it different. Look at what we did when we um, cut, the, uh, cut the suction off. Or cut the water off, I guess. We're still using suction. 1,800 went everywhere. And then we cut dry. 4,700. Now, I'll tell you, when we cut high and dry, I wanted to quit. The mercury vapor numbers were unbelievable high. I was really kind of getting scared. And I tried to get mad at you quit, and he goes, no, no, we've got to finish this. We're going to publish it. We've got to finish this. And I said, well, I'm glad I'm moving out of here in two weeks. We were doing this in my old office. I was building another one. I would have never done this study in my office if I hadn't been getting out of it. I left that for my landlord to deal with. So... The, the numbers were huge after we did this. I mean, way off the charts. So we walked around to my hygiene side, which was through, I mean, the area we were working was a big room, but it was totally closed. The doors were closed. We went over to the hygiene side, started taking our garb off, our mask off, because you saw how we were, uh, we were dressed up. And you hadn't noticed, you're getting ready to notice. And there was a drone on that side of the office. And... I said, why don't we check, see what the vapor is over here? And it was over 10 micrograms. I said, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> we opened all the windows. We turned on all our tact airs and uh, dinner air vacs that we had. Left the offices wide open that night. And uh, we came back in the next morning. Everything was down to zero. and We could get back in there. But, I mean, it was not safe to be in that office. <clears throat> So our conclusion is with all the controls that we use, the dentist team and patients are still exposed to mercury vapor in particular. And we knew that. We knew we were exposed to vapor. That's why we wear masks. To prevent exposure, we feel like all skin surfaces should be protected with material which is impervious to mercury particulate and mercury vapor, and that's a question mark, okay? Because um, we have not found that ideal material that fits both requirements. So... My SR, our SR, Scientific Review, um, we're proposing that our techniques can be improved. Um, and this is the part that you're not going to like to do. I didn't like wearing a mask when I started wearing a mask. Okay? And this is where you're going to think we're a little, I'm a little crazy. And right now there's only four of us really doing this. You don't have to do it to get accredited. You can be Superman if you want to. I wouldn't advise it because it gets you pretty sick. Unless you have the right genes. Then <laughs> you doesn't matter. So I feel like maximum protection uh, involves full coverage for the team and the patient. And, and I, be, I want you all to really understand me. This is, I'm doing the talking here, not IOMT. Okay? This is not our official doctrine, protocol, whatever you want to call it. This is just giving you the science, letting you make the decision. 
The vapor protection, the previous slides I showed you, that's our official stuff for accreditation. Okay? This is if you want to do this, if you look at the science, read the study, think you can do it appropriate for you, this is me talking. This is me trying to get you to do it. Because the reason I'm standing up here is I got sick. I don't want y'all to get sick. Okay? All right. So full coverage for team and patient. Full face aspirator mask with mercury filters. We, that's what we say to do now. But maybe a little better protection. Auxiliary suctions, tactair and mercury ionizer, maybe not really absolutely. But I think it is part of keeping the environment clean when the procedure is finished. You know, it runs all day long. It's, they've got science that shows it works. So it's helping get your air down levels down quicker, uh, according to their science. I think you should use those cleanup suctions. It helps protect from particulate. But if you're covering everything up and getting rid of it, uh, it's not probably that big a deal, but I think it, you ought to do it. And the whole room air filtration, you should have some kind of air filter with a mercury filter in it. Not one you buy down at uh, Best Buy, but one that actually has a mercury filter in it. It just continuously runs to help keep your room environment better. Um, the hand cream, I think, is important as a cleanser uh, to help protect you, too. So here's what my patients look like. I use a Tyvek material. It comes on a big roll. And this hood also I get from them just to cover their hair and neck and give the neck covered. Uh, I'm going to show you different ways to do it. I'm going to show you pictures of the four dentists I know of that are doing this. And it's Maddie, myself, and the Warwicks, Robin and David. Okay? So this is my patient set up. Uh, this is my office. The tack there is sitting back there. Here's my sniffer. This is me back under there somewhere. This is Kim. Or maybe, yeah, that's probably Kim. I got two assistants. But that's Kim. Um, somewhere down there there's a little hole that I'm working on teeth. And that's all pretty much all I see. Now, how long do we stay like this? Because guess what? These things are hot. Now, I like these better than the surgical gowns. Dave likes surgical gowns better. It doesn't matter which one you use. These breathe, but they are designed as biohazard suits so they don't let particulate through. But they do breathe, so they let vapor through. The surgical gowns let vapor through less. But they're hot. They don't breathe. I work in the South. It's hot. Um, so I get these things and I cut them out fast, and we will do four quadrants at a time. And probably the most time it's going to take me to get four quadrants of amalgams out, I'm going to anesthetize everything. This has changed the way I practice. Uh, if I'm doing all four quadrants, I'll anesthetize the whole mouth. Then I'll put this junk on, and we'll get in there and cut fast as we can. And I probably, the most I'll have this on is about 15 minutes. Okay? The less time I have it on, the better, I promise you. Disadvantage of this type mask, I cannot wear my loops. I can wear corrective lenses. I cannot wear my loops. Okay? So there's solutions for that. I have learned to be able to take mercury out just with my regular uh, corrective lenses. And then I get rid of all this stuff. So, here's a, <clears throat> this is Dr. Warwick, okay, um, and his assistant, and Dave said, make sure you tell him I'm waiting on my, you can tell that's Dave because you see his shirt, he's always got a Hawaiian shirt on, so, <laughs> he said, make sure you tell him I'm waiting for my assistant to come tie up my gown, so he hadn't tied his gown all the way up yet for the picture. He uses um, a different type of mercury vapor mask and a face shield. And he's got a hairnet on. A little bit of exposure right there, but we don't know if particularly it's getting there or not. We didn't test that, we didn't test that surface. Um, and then he's going to tie up better. But that's very adequate. You see his patient is covered a little different, but somewhere in there there's a patient. There's a mouth to work on. So he's got his patient covered up. He's got his auxiliary suction. There's a nasal air in there for his patient, okay? And then this is Dr. Young's office. He, he dresses similar. I mean, Maddie actually found these suits, and he just puts his mask on on top, and I'll just pull my hood up over the mask. But he's using, he's using we're basically using the same, same kind of setup, okay? 
This is a uh, this is Dr. Warren's patient. Very well protected. Okay. Can some patients not handle this? A little claustrophobic? Yeah. You have to coax them through it or maybe use some sedation for some of these patients to get them through this. Um, I won't refuse not to cover them, but if they fight it and if they can't even put the rubber dam on, it, you know, I tell them, don't breathe. <laughs> Hold your breath. <laughs> and we'll get it out as quick as we can. Most people can tolerate it. You talk to them, you explain to them. Uh, and if they do require some sedation, there's, you know, we'll use some sedation on them to get them through it. And they, obviously this costs money too, right? So uh, we charge for it. Um, actually, all these materials, you'd think they would cost a lot, but just the disposable materials are probably 25 to $30, depending on what you're using. Uh, those suits cost 650 a piece. And the rolls, big old huge roll, lasts a long time. It's about 300 bucks when I buy a roll of paper. Uh, I charge a nominal fee, like $75. Maddie charges $300 something dollars. David, $40. Okay. All right. And then uh, when David sent me these pictures, I'm going, why didn't I think of this? Yeah, you got a bracket table back there with instruments all over it. Some of them you're going to be using during the removal of the amalgam. Most of them you're not. Cover them up. Just cover them up. Then you can put your contaminated instruments there. You can take them out of the room, get them cleaned up, get them to the sterilization area, and remove that source of contamination. And then your other instruments haven't been contaminated. I'm going, I thought we thought of everything, but that's just so simple to do right there. Okay? Um, so three of the four dentists are in the room right now uh, that are doing this, and Robin's on the way. Why, why, isn't, why isn't everyone using this level of protection? Well, one, we haven't made this uh, an official suggested technique because we're not a police force. We're not a state board. Um, our members aren't required to do this, but I will tell you something. When you identify yourself as an IMT member, you're going to get referrals. And those patients know what is expected. They know what to expect. And if you're not using at least the minimum protection that we advise, they will walk out of your office and you'll never see them again. They're smart. We need more studies to uh, really determine the best barrier protection or are we really protecting ourselves? Do our mercury levels go up during the procedure? Or, uh, it would be nice to test more surfaces. How, how bad is our floor getting contaminated each time? I mean, it's kind of scary. Maybe what we really need is a dedicated, sealed-up room to do mercury in, removal in. You don't even go in it till you garb up, and then you go to your other rooms to finish the procedure. And I'm not being a little facetious here. I don't really think it's going to be that, it's that necessary. But this just opens up a can of worms. Um, the gowns are uncomfortable. I'm telling you up front, you're not going to walk around in them all day, and we don't want you to. What we want is you want to change your protective garments as soon as the mercury's gone. Get rid of it. Get it out of the operatory. Um, Wazoo, we call Mark Wazoo, if y'all had not met him yet. He, he washes his, and he's tested his washing machine. Either way, we are contributing some pollution to the environment. Mine go out, I go out back, take it off, put it in a trash can, it goes to the dump. We hadn't studied how much particulates on there, but I believe we have sniffed the trash can and there's some vapor coming out of it. So we're collecting some of it. Is that ideal? No. But then again, I'd be sending a 55-gallon drum off once a week, it seems like some weeks, to a recycler. And can we afford that? And they would probably look at it and go, what are we going to do with this? So that's a problem. Um, this data has not been published, so nobody knows this data yet. We haven't published it. Uh, we're working on it, partially my fault, partially because we're running another little addendum study to it. We are having a breakout session on this tomorrow at 2. Tomorrow, Friday? When is it? Friday at 2 o'clock. Uh, we'll have some more information if you all like to attend that. Um, so... Mercury is kind of like alcohol. It makes you 10 foot tall and bulletproof.
All right, so I stuck this slide in another day. It's not really in the right place. I forgot about it to move it. Um, this is a Mercon products. I use these as wipes to clean off the handpiece head, and any instruments might have gotten contaminated. Uh, uh, I use a spray. I use it on the part of the cleanup that you keep. You can use it to wipe down surfaces. Um, I think this is a Canadian company, actually. In the States, we get it. Uh, it's Ross Healthcare. Um, in the States, and they make other containers, trays, that we get. Um, well, all kind of container prop. But in the States, I get it through Granger.com. In Canada, you may be able to buy it directly from Ross. Uh, Dr. Pierre LaRousse found this product for us. And it's, it's, it's a nice product. It cost uh, 57 bucks U.S. dollars for the wipes, and uh, spray is like 60 bucks. And it lasts, they last pretty good. Some additional uh, patient protection that we do. We mix up some N-acetylcysteine with a little vitamin C, and a uh, capsule of that and a tablespoon of that. Mix it up every day so it's fresh. And we have them rinse with that after we take the rubber dam off to try to trap any mercury particulate that's gotten under the rubber dam that may be still attached to the tissues. And you also want to make sure that all your suctions are vented outside the office, uh, not back into your, your equipment room. So, have you been a superman? Are you going to continue to be a superman? Are you worried about your heavy metal load? Um, are you one of those lucky guys that can get excreted? You know, there are lucky people out there who it doesn't. You have the right genes, you're a good excreter, you're not going to have much load. So, testing for mercury levels in humans, the half life of mercury in the blood is quite short. Uh, currently used blood tests don't really indicate tissue levels. Um, Urine levels in mercury toxic individuals should be low as mercury is not naturally eliminated through the kidneys. It's eliminated through the gut, and feces, uh, perspiration, and exhaled. And a gentleman brought me an article in the Canadian Dental Journal or Canadian Dental Association just put out that they did a bunch of urine tests and found nobody's putting out any mercury, which is a bogus study. Um, so a challenge test is with DMPS. And 60% of excreted mercury is from dental amalgams when you use DMPS in some studies. And the total urinary mercury correlated to the surface area of amalgams. And this recent study by the Canadian Journal or Association says the exact opposite of this study, which was done a long time ago. And this was uh, the ADA conducted DMSA studies on over 4,000 dentists, and the mean urine level was 14.2 micrograms, a little higher than three, which is what you're looking for. 19.1 were over 20. 10 per 11 percent were over the CDC maximum acceptable level of 30, and 4.9 percent were over 50, and that's the level found in the induced tremors. And 1.3 percent were over 100. So they did have different data that they decided they probably wouldn't publish out. But as I said before, you should refer to a physician for this. You shouldn't be doing it. Uh, neuroscience um, has a mercury tri test. Actually, this is Quicksilver. That's the wrong side. This is B. Chris Shade's uh, company. I urge you don't miss his lecture. He'll explain that. I'm not going to go over it much since he's here this weekend. Uh, do not miss this. It's fascinating. We have porphyrin tests you can have done. But Chris's test is blood, hair, and urine. And it gives quantitative and qualitative data. And I'll let Chris do that because he's going to be better at it than I am. Porphyrin tests. Porphyrins are toxicants like heavy metals and xenobiotics. They bind to one or more enzymes to produce specific patterns of urinary porphyrins or proteins. that shouldn't be there. These oxidized porphyrins accumulate in the body. They become toxicants that cause tissue degradation, and they appear elevated in urine when the cellular pathway for heme synthesis is blocked because of these toxins. And they, they have a specific pattern that they develop for specific, specific toxins. 
So you can have a porphyrin test done to see if you've got mercury, if you've got pesticides, or what kind of toxins uh, that you have in there. Okay? Uh, you're going to hear about fluoride this afternoon. Uh, we urge you to quit using fluoride. Uh, we do have composites that don't have fluoride. These are good composites that's tested very low in BPAs, made by BOCO. These are the ones Bill and I use. And um, for those of you who aren't members, I really hope you join this weekend after you've heard, heard us speak in all the weekend. Uh, don't, don't judge us by our craziness in here today. <laughs> You'll hear more science that backs it up all weekend. I hope you take these mercury safe protocols seriously that you learn today, implement them as you can into your everyday routine for every procedure that involves amalgam. You'll be doing yourself a favor, your team a favor, and your patients a favor. We'd like you to become a fluoride-free practice, including elimination of fluoride-containing composites, and installing our equipment and using protocols to protect the environment inside and outside of your office. Equipment costs money. It's not a huge amount, but it may be a huge amount to you at this current time. So we hope you could start using and buying what you need and add it as you can go, and we'll be glad to help you anytime help you incorporate these techniques into your practice. Um, Bill and I and Maddie, we're all available. You'll have our contact information on these slides, and you can have another mentor program. I urge you to take advantage of that, and we will help you get this implemented into your office. Um, our members are leaders in biological dentistry, and we communicate the difference to our patients and colleagues. The guys before me, are some of the most courageous dentists I've ever met. Uh, I probably wouldn't be practicing today. I might not even be alive if I hadn't met them. And that's why I'm in here today, uh, hoping that many of you can avoid health problems that I had when I practiced like Superman. Uh, we've got a little bit over, but right now in the room we have uh, Dave gone. We've got two of the dentists that are using this technique. So I, we could probably sneak five minutes for questions and then catch more of them at the end of the day if y'all have any questions. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You got a mic? Um, we have a lot of members that do that. Yes, they do that. Uh, we haven't tested that, but I'm sure they do a pretty good job. And I'm not sure if you can do that for accreditation. If you're thinking about accreditation, you'd have to ask. All the time. I know. But if you're thinking about accreditation, I'm not sure if they accept it. But I'm saying that probably works pretty good. My other question is, what do you do with the mercury waste? Where do you send it after you collect those big bins? Um, do you actually ship it there? I buy my, I buy my container from the Mars company that has a separator. I'm not sure where it's shipped to. It comes with a label. It doesn't go back to him. It goes to a recycler. But I think I get my canister from him. Uh, Maddie, where you get yours, you know? It's the EPA OSHA certified hazmat company. I'm not sure the name. Yeah. Are you in the States or Canada? States. States. Thanks. If you paint some Luma block around the neck of the teeth after you put the rubber dam on, then when you take the rubber dam back off again, you won't have that gray sludge on the gingiva when you're done. So that's one more layer of protection you can add is that Luma block right. around the neck of the dam. Two more questions, then we've got to go eat. And we'll have a breakout Friday, too. We can continue this. Where we're going to show even some more studies we've done. One more. And you can, if you'll contact me. I'll be glad to tell you where we get ours, and then the Mars Company too. I just don't know off the top of my head. No, you got to have somewhere to ship it to. Nature, which has been 
the historic way, the way things have been done in the U.S. That's right. No, it needs to get shipped. Yeah. Um, have you addressed the economic benefits of not placing amalgam for other dentists? I'm just looking at our office and our production target being $20 a minute for the doctor. You know, it takes an extra five minutes minimum to place amalgam, so the cost right there goes up by $100, and that's not what you uh, what you pay for filling materials. So um, is, is that something that could maybe undercut the use of amalgam in dentistry? Well, I mean, most dentists want to place amalgam because it's cheap and quick and profitable. Okay? So, I mean, if you think I charge for composite what you charge for amalgam, I don't. I charge more. I'm more expensive than most dentists, probably. We charge more for amalgam because it costs more to place it. Okay. Well, just, I mean, we are in a business. All that extra stuff does cost money. Charge for it. Figure out what it costs you, figure out what you want to make on it, then charge it. Matty charges 300 something bucks for his. He's using the same stuff I am. I charge 75 And I don't know how our fees compare. We don't, we're mainly only practice 50 minutes from each other. We see some of the same patients. You know, we'll have patients come to both of us to get an opinion. So, um, you got to make money in this. I mean, we're in this to make money. I didn't. I'm not going to go. I'm in a hazardous duty job.